Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Marty Harris has a heart condition that could cause her to pass out at any time. So before she learned about service dogs, she really had a limited number of things that she could do. It was very hard for her to just live a life as quote unquote normal Um like we would think of normal driving, um, things like going out, those things were really difficult for her. So she, um, through a process, which I'll actually let Marty tell you about, she was able to find Adele, who is one of the world's first cardiac alert service dogs. And um, one, they have been featured in People Magazine, which is a pretty big deal. Um, And now they are, they have just released a documentary about their journey together called Adele and Everything After. There are links on our site, uh, theoryofpets.com, if you want to check those things out and see uh, some more information about Marty and Adele. But for now, I'm going to let Marty talk to you about her story about Adele. Adele now actually lives with Marty in retirement, and uh, she's found herself a new um, service dog to work with her so she talks a little bit about that process and the way the two dogs interact together Um, so I will let Marty take it from here. I was diagnosed from a very early age with a heart condition that caused me to faint. Um, I didn't get the exact name of my condition until I was about in my 30s but I've always had this Um, and I was diagnosed with the full title is Acute Malignant Vasovagal Neurocardiogenic Syncope. Oh, my goodness. Uh, which is a huge title. basically means that I'm a fainter. I faint a lot. <laughs> um, and when I do faint, it, my heart does stop, and it takes a, a, a few 20, 30 seconds for it to uh, get the blood back up to it again. And my service dogs, they are able to detect... Um, before I have any of my uh, signals, they're able to detect what's coming and let me know. So they get me into a safe position to either stand still or sit down or to lay down, depending on how much danger I'm in, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Um, so you can they, feel the fainting spells coming on? Well, my signals that I used to get were so instantaneous, like I didn't even have time to react to I it. See. I would get things like I would lose my hearing or my arm would go numb or um, just that sort of blackness that overcomes you. And as soon um, as those happened, almost instantly you would faint so you didn't have time to prepare yourself. Right. But the dogs seem to be able to pick up on the signals my heart is sending out before I even get those symptoms. So they they prevent me from pushing my body too far to the point where I pass out. That's amazing. Yeah, they're not they're not stopping or like you know curing my heart condition because it's still happening. It's just they're preventing me from being injured by fainting and falling downstairs or you know in the middle of the road or things that I was doing on a regular basis before they came into my life. So how early can they detect it? How many minutes are is it between when they signal you and when you actually have the fainting spell? Um. Well, that's kind of complicated because because they're able to let me know it's it's coming. It doesn't. I don't push my body to the point where I actually faint. I've only fainted twice with the dogs. Wow! And both times, both times I was sick, and um, I just wasn't in my right mind. <laughs> with the, you know, like when you have the flu and you just aren't thinking clearly. And I yeah. knew the dogs were alerting me, but I just wasn't reacting to the dogs the way I should be. And then I did faint. Um, but both times, the dogs, they caught me and prevented me from injuring myself. So the, um, the, I say as long as I listen to you know, my service dogs, I'm going to be okay. Yeah, of course. So when you, you say you had this condition as a child, and of course, you probably didn't know much about it back then, um, what 
what triggered you to want to work with a service dog? Uh, desperation is really what started all of it. I had uh, been diagnosed. I, um, I'd been on every possible medication. I'd been prepped for a pacemaker twice, and then it was decided that it wasn't the right avenue for me because there's no guarantee it would work, and I'd be stuck with the pacemaker. Um, and, you know, it really took my cardiologist, who's one of the best in the world, Dr. James Januzzi, saying, Marty, I'm sorry, we've tried everything. Medicine hasn't really caught up to what you have yet. And he goes, we're going to have to look into alternatives. Uh, that was sort of a scary thing to hear. Absolutely. Um, uh, and I was like, well, I, didn't, I didn't really understand what he meant by alternatives. And uh, one day I was watching a, a show on dogs that detect cancer in people. And it was very early um, testing, what they were trying to see if dogs had this ability or not. And it got me thinking, I wonder if they could detect cancer, can they detect cardiac and so I called uh, Dr. Januzzi up, and he said, nothing that I've ever heard of with dogs doing this. He goes, but let's look into it. Um, and we started calling different organizations, and everybody said, no, we don't, but why don't you try this one? And they gave me a long list um, from one to the other, and I just went down the list. And eventually I got to Canine Partners for Life, and they said, well, that's really interesting. Uh, we don't do that. We're curious if our dogs could do that. Would you be willing to be the guinea pig and come down and work with our dogs and let's see if any of them have this ability? So I did, and uh, they decided to start with dogs that could already detect um, seizures in people. They yeah, thought that makes sense. It's sort of a, a, it's, it's a natural instinct. Some dogs have it and some dogs don't. And so they had me work with... Um, four different dogs and at the time I believe two out of the four were alerting me but I, at the time you have to realize I didn't know what an alert was right. I didn't know what the dogs were doing <laughs> um, and there was a there was a hill outside of their facility and they asked a very tiny hill but to me it was Mount Everest <laughs> <laughs> um, they asked me. They asked me to walk up the hill with each dog, and I went up with this one dog, and it laid across my seat and wouldn't get up. And I, I tried everything. You know, I've had dogs my whole life, so I'm kind of used to them. And I, I turned to the trainers. And I'm like, okay, I think your dog is broken. <laughs> it's not getting up. <laughs> and and she, uh, the trainer turned to me. She goes, no, I think the dog's trying to tell you something. And that was sort of my first realization of, oh. Maybe they are. Like, maybe this could work. And I was very excited. And that dog turned out to be Adele, which was my who they placed me with. So she's she's been saving my life from the moment I met her. So you kind of hung out with these dogs, I guess, um, to see if they would alert you. That's how it kind of started? Yes. Yeah, there's not any sort of training that they did for the dog to be able to do this. They just observed the dogs to see if any of them... Um, were reacting to me the same way they sort of react to people who have seizures. So were you fainting, um, like, if you did too much, say, like, strenuous activity and your heart was pumping fast, was that typically when you would have a fainting spell? That is definitely one of them. A change of position is a big one with vasovagal, like, going from laying down to sitting up or sitting to standing, um, those can be triggers just because my heart can't keep up with the rate change of the pulse. So it, it's um, safe to say you were fainting quite often then before the dogs. Oh, before the dogs. Yeah, I was, it got to the point where I was going to the emergency room almost weekly. Wow. Um, it, it would be because I would faint in the, you know, the streets of Boston yeah. and people would call 911. But the thing was, by the time I got to the hospital, I felt fine. Right. Um, you know, my heart just needed time to, catch up basically mm -hmm. wow that's that's amazing so you go to canine partners for life you meet adele um and they place you with her which is um one of the things that um i will mention in the introduction uh for the podcast is that um you've created this documentary now about uh your your life with adele um and she so she was basically the first cardiac um 
assisting dog, I guess, service dog that there was. This wasn't heard of before Adele. Well, well, I like to be very careful with that because I don't want to dishonor anybody who may have had one before her that we've just never heard of. Um, I have... uh, I know that she's the first one definitely placed by Canine Partners for Life. Like I said, with all my research that I did beforehand, I never came across another one. Uh, but if there is another one that's older and done the same thing as Adele, I certainly want to honor them. Sure. Um, to me, it's not about her being the first. It's just about her being what she is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, it's remarkable. really amazing. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, I've never had anybody come up to me and tell me their story about you know, their dog being able to do this before her. Well, it's, it I sounds like it your condition is, but... <laughs> is fairly rare. Um, I think that uh, vasovagal is actually pretty common in people. Most people will have some sort of vasovagal episode in their lifetime um, where they pass out. But I just have um, an extreme uh, version of it, I guess. Um and I have other complications with other medical things that make it so certain medicines don't work for me, the reasons why I'm not a candidate for a pacemaker. A lot of times, people who have conditions similar to mine, these other options work for them. They just didn't work for me. So kind of a interesting you know, interesting case, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So once you, um, you were partnered with Adele, she was your first service dog. Um, so how did the documentary come about? Was that just something that you wanted to kind of pay tribute to her, or did somebody approach you about it? Uh, no, actually, um, it started all because of a fundraiser. Um, when I first uh, was placed with Adele, you have to go to team training, it's called, and it's a month long out of your life every day you're training eight nine hours a day and you're basically learning what the dogs can do um sorry dogs is that for all at that point. service dogs or most service dogs this is for the way canine partners for life operates i, see. I know okay. different organizations do different things but their their system is for the first year of the dog's life and their puppy they're in the puppy prison program and then when they turn one, they go to Canine Partners for Life and they get their intensive training service skills then. But as far as like seizures and uh, the cardiac dogs, that's an ability they have or they don't. They can't train that. Um, so it sort of puts those dogs into an upper echelon of, of abilities. They're very, very special dogs. So is it... Um... Um, is it more like breeds? Are there certain breeds that they look for, or is there something they just sort of try puppies and see if it works with them? Well, with Canine Partners for Life, I know that um, their breeding program is mostly Labradors, and it's just because of their um, temperament, of their size, of their um, health. Um, you know, a good sturdy dog, you want a dog that's, you know, you'll be able to use for balance, which is something I use them for when I get dizzy. Um, they're also my motor, so they kind of pull me along so I don't have to exert too much with my heart. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, they, they do, I know Canine Partners for Life has uh, standard poodles for people who have severe allergies. Um, but, and then they've had other dogs, you know, throughout their, what is it, 20, 25 years of being in business. But they they lean towards the Labradors. They just seem to have really good results with them. So do um, they breed? Um, do they find it to be like a genetic thing? Do they breed dogs that can do it in hopes that the puppies will be able to do it as well? That is a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I was just I curious. Find that myself. Hey, yeah. That's a good question. Well, I um, um, one thing that I will do is I'll link to the Canine Partners for Life website. I did check it out um, briefly, and there's so much information on there um, for people about you know the the business itself, the the um, foundation, and about um, partnering with a dog. If anybody else maybe is thinking they're listening and thinking, you know, geez, maybe a, th- ser- uh, a service dog might be right for me. Um, so they have lots right. of stuff on there as well as like information about volunteering and donating and things like that. If people are interested in that. So I will link to their site uh, because it's filled with great info. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, it's, it's far as the original question, which I totally drifted away from, <laughs> um, about 
how did the documentary come about? Yeah, I think that was part um, of my too. <laughs> no, no, no. With, with the, I um, was placed with Adele, and I went down for the month-long training. Um, those bills really added up, and I, I hadn't planned in advance for that. And, you know, you're away from your home for a month. You're staying in a hotel. You have a caregiver. Oh, yeah. you know, you, all the things that you need to do to be away from your home for a month um, could add up. And then, of course, you know, the vet bills and the, you have to go back to canine partners, you know, every one or two years for reevaluation. So it, it adds up. And I thought, you know, when it comes time for the next dog, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do a fundraiser and try and help with some of these costs. Yeah. And, and when I, I'd, I'd never done a fundraiser before. So I looked online and I was like, oh, okay, I can do one of these. Um, I'm going to forget the name of the platforms you can use, but where you do like a little video and people can donate money. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, thought, they have a GoFundMe now and there's a lot of different yeah. funding websites out there. Yeah. So I, I picked one of those and I was like, okay, now I need a video. I, I knew uh, in the building I live in in Boston, there was a film company because I'd seen some of their, their films before. And I thought, well, I can just go and ask them. Maybe they know of a student in the Boston area that would volunteer. Oh yeah. Um, so I really just approached them as, you know, looking for help to make a little three minute video. Now, <clears throat> Melissa Dowler is the, um, director of the film and she's the one that I approached she's my neighbor and she didn't really know anything about me she she'd seen Adele and me around the building but she didn't know if I was blind or you know if there's something else wrong with me she you know she just didn't know she'd never really approached me and the big reason is she has a little dog named Angel that's a little Yorkshire Terrier that had sort of a complex about Adele <laughs> Every time he saw Adele, he would bark and bark and bark and bark, and she would scoop him up and say sorry, and she would run away. <laughs> um, so it was it was funny to me. Like I, I was afraid of her dog or anything. I just thought it was always really funny how she would run away, and she was sort of mortified about her dog's behavior, which is why she never. <laughs> she's like, your dog was always so good in the hallways and in the street, and there was mine just like running behind it, barking and screaming. <laughs> so. That, that's sort of how our relationship started. Um, but I went to her. I, I got her one day without the dog, uh, without uh, Angel with her, and I said what I was looking for, the little three-minute video. And she goes, well, why don't you come down to my office and we'll, we'll, let me hear what all you need and we'll see if we can find somebody for you. And I did, and what I thought was funny was I was there talking for like an hour and a half and I thought that was a lot for a three-minute video. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but she just kept asking questions. And then she said, well, can you come back tomorrow? And I was like, sure. I, I thought this whole process was a little strange. But I'm like, it's Hollywood. What do I know? <laughs> and I did go back the next day, and she had her whole staff sitting around the table. And she's like, okay, Marty, tell them your story again. And I, I was, like, looking at everybody, I'm thinking, okay, maybe one of these is one of the students. <laughs> like, the, but they were all her staff, and I didn't really know that at the time. And um, so we went through it another hour and a half later. She's like, Artie, we're going to do the three-minute video for you. Um, we want to help you with this, but we'd really love to do a full-length documentary as well. And that threw me. Um, um, I'm a very private person. I've learned to be able to um, do interviews and things like this because of the movie, but before any of this, I, I'm a person that, that like hides behind other people in pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to be the, the center of attention at all, so it's been a real learning process for me, like coming out of my shell and doing all of this. And it yeah. took Melissa, it took Melissa a long time to convince me to do the documentary, and you know, I think the thing that did it for me was just my husband saying, you know, it's a chance to educate people. And he's a teacher, and so that's a big thing in our life is, you know, just the more you know, the more you grow. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, well, I'll do it. And I just, I had to take myself out of the equation. I had to think, okay, it's not about me, it's about 
you know, Adele and her abilities. And, you know, it was coming up to the end of her, you know, working career. She was about to retire. And uh, Melissa, the director, just really thought, what a great way to tell the story of a service dog. Even though she didn't get all of Adele's backstory and, like, video and um, pictures of her, which added a challenge of how do you tell the service dog story when oh, you only absolutely. have the, the tail end of it. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but to the transition of me having to, you know, let go of her as my service dog and embrace a new one. Yeah. Uh, it was a story that hadn't been told before, so. Yeah, so was- the documentary is called Adele and Everything After, and um, I, I think Ryan mentioned it's available at the end of the month, right, January 30th? Yeah, it has pre-sales now on iTunes, um, so anybody can go on and order it, and it'll be available to them on January 30th. Um, it is also, I've been giving a little spiel here for you, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it'll be released by Gravitas Ventures on January 30th this year. Um, it will also be available on demand on iTunes, Amazon Video, Google Play, Verizon Fios, DirecTV, Dish, and others. Like I said, you can pre-order it on iTunes today if you want, and... For more information, please visit AdeleMovie.com, and don't forget to go and like our Facebook page, which is um, Adele and Everything After. So, and I will link to, for anybody that's listening, that's, you know, you're, we've talked about a few different websites. Um, all those links will be right on our site as well, and we're um, going to share the podcast on YouTube. They're always on YouTube, so it'll be um, underneath there if anybody is listening and wants to check out some of those websites. Um, Canine Partners for Life is there, the theadelmovie.com, and then the Facebook uh, page as well if you guys want to check all of that out. Uh, we'll link to all of that. Um, and, of course, if you want to get the movie, uh, you can do so early or um it this is going to be published around the end of the month so um actually it might already be available when people are listening um to this but they can they can definitely get it um in all those places you listed that's fantastic it's going to be available really um widely for for everybody to have access to very excited um we've sort of learned along the process here that for an independent documentary to be picked up like this by, you know, a, a large distributor like Gravitas is kind of rare. And so we feel very privileged to, to be able to, to do this and share our story with everybody. You know, the, I've, I've been so lucky this year. I've got to travel around to film festivals all over the United States and Canada and just meet wonderful people and just the love everybody's been extending towards me and what was a, a very challenging transition in my life. You know, I, they, I'd i say that, you know, people held me up and really helped me through it and I'm eternally grateful to, for this opportunity and I know a lot of people who transition from one service dog to another don't have this sort of support that I've had and um, I would hope that they all at least get a taste of it at some point because you really do need it. It's much more challenging than you would think. Actually, I, and like I mentioned, um, I, I got to watch the movie early, so I'm very grateful for that. But um, it really, on so many different levels, it's, it's, I don't, I don't even know. It's, um, inspiring for sure it's heartwarming it's a little bit heart-wrenching too um and I think it really puts into perspective for somebody like me I've never uh, obviously had a service dog that I rely on um but I am a teacher um and so I or I was a teacher before um I was a freelance writer and I still work uh in the school districts around our area and um so I've worked with a lot of kids and families who have had service dogs and um gotten to know them and how important that dog is to their family and that person's whole life. I mean, it's everything. I can imagine probably for you before you had Adele, um, were you able to like drive or do, you know, the everyday things that a lot of people take for granted? I I am. I'm lucky. I'm one of the few that get to still drive because I don't faint when I'm just sitting um, mine is more, I would faint getting out of the car. 
<laughs> that I ever was sitting in the car. So I've always been allowed to drive, and I still am. Yeah, that's what actually the number two question I get at every film festival is, how are you allowed to drive still? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Dr. Januzzi gave me permission, so don't like, anybody get my license revoked. I'm still good. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, you know, just the everyday tasks that, that therapy dogs can help people do that they weren't able to do before um, or just make it you know an easier experience to get through every day without you know in your case a fainting spell Um, I know some people who um, you know with physical disabilities doors can be opened literally doors can be opened light switches can be turned on um, things can be retrieved for them without you know this huge exercise of maybe like going upstairs to get something you forgot or whatever um you know so it makes life easier it makes life more manageable and for a lot of people you know like I said we we take a lot of things for granted how easy life is for you when you don't have some sort of disability so when you do and you have a dog that can make life easier for you it's so amazing and I think you know Adele and everything after it definitely highlights that and and what a therapy dog can do for you um but for me the biggest thing that i saw was that transition for you Uh, i've been a dog owner my whole life and so of course we've lost many dogs over the years and it's heartbreaking and it's really devastating Uh, and it's something that you know it's like losing a loved one you go through a mourning period you have a few days in the very beginning where you can't do anything without bursting into tears it's it's very very devastating So to see it from a different perspective of you're not necessarily losing your dog, but you're you're losing this helper that's been with you for so long, that's made your life easier, that you've relied on for years, probably for the most part. Um, And now you have to make that transition and, and have that bond with another animal and it 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 definitely brought that to light I think it's something that even though I've worked with multiple kids and families that have therapy dogs and service dogs it's something that I never that's one aspect that you just don't think about unless you have to go through it yourself right and you know Adele she did she saved my life daily Um, she alerted me anywhere from 20 to 30 times a day and any one of those times it could have been the one that I ended up in the hospital or you know I could have um, you know, I've fallen downstairs before and was bleeding before her. You know, I was lucky, you know, to still be alive. I've had numerous Absolutely. concussions throughout my life. And, you know, she, she had, you know, made it so that wasn't a danger for me anymore. And I was, had the freedom to go out and do things that I was scared to do. You know, it, it was scary just to go to the grocery store. I didn't know if I was going to end up at the hospital. So she definitely gave me confidence and help to build up my my strength too because you don't realize just how weak you get when you stop living life when you kind of shut yourself in and it makes it harder to even just go down the block um but you know she gave me confidence and strength and having to take her out and walk her and take care of her needs made me a little bit stronger every day but then you know she built me up and built me up and built me up to the point where i could walk for three miles or I could climb up a mountain, or I could, you know, we went whitewater rafting and things together. So she, like, really gave me life. But then I started to notice her slowing down. You know, she wasn't able to keep up with me anymore. And so, you know, once she retired, and she's very happily retired now. She's <laughs> actually laying at my feet snoring at the moment. <laughs> um, you know, and I brought, you know, Hector into my life. Hector is... Uh, it's like when you get a new upgraded phone, <laughs> all these new features, and, and, you know, he's strong, and he, you know, I have, again, I feel like I'm kind of at that beginning, like I'm trying to keep up with him, Yeah. but knowing that he's going to lift me up to the next level, it's, it's an exciting adventure. Certainly. So when Hector came in, did Adele sort of, did she realize, okay, somebody else is here to take care of Marty, I'm, you know, I can retire now, or does she still notify you every once in a while? Um, well, Adele is, uh, she will still alert me, that's just an instinct that she has, and she alerts me whenever I'm around her, and so sometimes I have Hector on one side alerting and her on the other, <laughs> so I'm twice, as, I'm twice as safe. Yeah. Um, but she, she will not do service skills anymore. You ask her to pick up anything, and she looks at Hector like, 
Maybe that's your job. <laughs> that's your job now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she is very much the alpha dog, and if he is not doing a service skill to her standards, she will step in, show him how to do it, and then watch him until he gets it right. So, <laughs> she's, she's very funny. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's so wonderful. It's so nice to hear that Adele is living out her retirement in a, a wonderful home. Still with you, of course. I think a lot of people, um, you know, working dogs in general, sometimes when they retire, you know, they, they get fostered or go into a new home. And that's such a tough adjustment exactly. for them, too. So it's nice to hear that she's still living life with you and enjoying Hector for the most part, it sounds like, too. <laughs> Yes, she is. Yeah, I'm, I feel very lucky that I was able to, you know, keep her. I know a lot of people can't, and I, that would just be in a whole other level of heartbreak that I'm glad I didn't have to go through. Absolutely, so, yeah, I, I agree. I, and I know a lot of people wonder what the difference between a service dog and a therapy dog are. Um, can you give us a little bit of information to help our listeners understand that major difference? I'm not going to, like, please don't make me an expert. <laughs> I guess the few, the few differences I know, um, therapy dogs are allowed to go into, say, a hospital setting or school, um, if, and that's their job. They're working at that. But um, they don't have the same privileges as, say, a service dog where they can't go into restaurants and into stores and um, on planes and um just the everyday things that we do, that's not part of their job title, so they don't have the same legal rights as a service dog does. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know, you know, a lot of therapy dogs, obviously working in schools, that's where um, I see them, but that that makes sense that, um, you know, like you said, the restaurants and the places where they wouldn't actually be uh, needed at that time, that they wouldn't be allowed access to. Right, right. So for um, your service I'm sure dogs, I'm sure you... there's other differences. Oh, go no, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was going to say that I, I'm sure there's other differences, but like I said, I'm not an expert, so um, I would talk to Canine Partners for Life about that. They would definitely know the the, the differences. Yeah, and um, so for your service dogs, um, do you have to register them through a certain program to have them, um, you know, be able to access? everywhere or is it different like in different states i'm assuming maybe have different laws about it um yeah there's another one i can't really answer canine partners for life they certify the service dog I see. um and and they they do work with um with lawmakers around the country trying to get laws um established because there really aren't a whole lot of laws about service dogs at this point but they're they're trying to to make it so that it's um, more clear what our rights are with service dogs and where we're allowed to go and what the do- what's expected of the dog's behavior. Um, unfortunately, you know, in our society, there are people who take advantage of, you know, they can buy a vest for 20 bucks, put it on their dog, pay the service dog, and then, you know, that dog doesn't behave at the same level as, you know, my certified service dogs out in public. You know, they don't bark. They don't have, you know, elimination accidents. Um, they never growl. They don't eat off the floor. You know, they they have, you know, two years of training to become, you know, the, the best in the business, if you will. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I've been on planes with people who get a little vest and put on their dog and claim it's a service dog so that they don't have to pay that $50 to fly their dog. Because if you have a service dog, um, it's like your wheelchair or your cane. They aren't going to charge you right. to have it on the plane with you. It's you know, a necessity to you know, get you from point A to point B, which I'm very thankful for because I do travel a lot. Um, but there are people who will have their dogs and say it's a service dog, but then the dog is doing everything it's not supposed to do. And it gives a bad name to service dogs. So, yeah, yeah I, wish there were, I wish there were more rules and regulations and I wish people just wouldn't take advantage of it to save a few bucks. It, I don't think they realize the repercussions of their actions, you know, towards people who genuinely need the service dog to I agree. You know, save their life. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something that, you know, people just aren't educated about it. I, I love my dogs as much as the next person, but, you know, as much as I'd love to take them with us everywhere, I know my dogs don't have that training and, you know, 
that's always my thought is, you know, you're going to ruin it for the people that actually do need their dogs. Um, we actually, my husband and I, one time we went to Walmart and there was a lab um, when we have a chocolate lab too. So we're very familiar with the breed. Um, mm-hmm. And there was a lab in there with a service dog vest. And when they walked in the door, we, we noticed we're dog lovers. So we noticed, and um, it, it was very, seemed very uneasy you could just tell that you know it wasn't a service dog right off the bat you can sort of tell that they're not used to that type of environment and and being there um and so we actually in in our walmart our local walmart you walk in um to the grocery section and there's the produce section and so there was a little one of those little sample carts set up just shortly past the door um and the dog jumped up on because it was it obviously had food samples on it so the dog jumped up on the food sample cart and we both just looked at each other and thought you know of course that's not a service dog they don't behave like that um, but because it has the service dog vest and there aren't a lot of uh, laws and restrictions you know it is hard for businesses to you know mandate that and obviously they're not going to stop people at the door and say that they can't come in um, until they see right. behavior like that but once they see behavior like that and you're escorted out um, you know it becomes a problem and other people see them escorting out somebody with a service dog and they're not sure why that's happening and you know it, it's mixed signals and it's just not good for um, the the people, like you said, I mean, it's I don't think they do it on purpose, but they don't realize how it's right. affecting other people. Right, and then the next person that comes in with a trained service dog, they get stopped at the door, and they have to you know show their papers, and you know it it makes life more challenging. Which, like if you had walked into a store, and every time you did, you had to pull out and show your ID, you know, you get a little frustrated. Absolutely, it, you know, it's a form of discrimination, and like. It's like it's not an added challenge enough for like the, everything we have to go through just to get out of the house. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> but, yeah. But to add, add that, you know, constantly like seeing that look on people's faces, they come up to you and, you know, try and stop you from just doing a normal thing like going to the grocery store or, you know, going to pick up your medicine, you know, or whatever it is that you're, you're, you've got the energy up to go and do that day and then to have people try and stop you because of somebody else's bad behavior before it could be very frustrating yeah well i'm happy to hear that canine partners for life is working and i'm sure there's other organizations out there too that are are trying to work towards that and get some some laws and regulations in place so that that becomes a little bit easier for you and everybody else that takes their service dogs with them you know everywhere they go on a daily basis so that's that's good to hear right and um you know there there are organizations around the world like international dog assistance um, that you can go to their websites and you can, you know, find legitimate service dog organizations. Um, but, you know, you got to be careful because there are a lot of scams out there too. You know, people say, oh, give us $10,000, we'll give you a dog. And then they do, but the dog's not trained and they give you a book and say, here's how you train the dog. So, you know, there, there, there are um, pitfalls in service dogs as well that a lot of people aren't aware of. So, you know, be careful. Yeah, you I know, think that's an your, important... Do your research. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important point to make, especially for anybody listening that might think that, um, you know, they hear your story and, and see how much it changed your life for the better, and they're thinking maybe a therapy dog or a service dog would be right for them, depending on their needs. Um, you need right. to work with a reputable organization. It's not something that, you know, like you said, just because they're charging a lot of money for a dog doesn't mean that the dog's been trained and and actually is worth that amount of money. It may be just somebody trying to get a lot of money for a regular everyday Labrador retriever. So um, it's important to do your research and really look into it. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned that you talked to your uh, cardiologist about it. So if it's it's a condition that you, you know, have a doctor or, um, you know, a a mental health professional that's working with you, um, I think that's a great resource to reach out and just say, hey, you know, do you know any organizations or could you help me find some? Um, That's a great resource as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I don't know that if you need to like share this with everybody, but when I agreed to do the documentary, my husband teases me for two things. He goes, one, Marty, you would never watch an animal movie. Like I gave up animal movies like 20 years ago because they're just too emotional for me. And then he was giving me a hard time because now I'm in one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's um, so funny. That's yeah. so me. I can't watch animal movies. Even like the cartoon animal movies that our kids watch get me sometimes. They are so emotional. 
they are. And so I would say to anybody who has doubts about seeing this movie because they have that same, you know, rule in their life that I did, uh, my my one diva request when we made this documentary was it had to have a happy ending. <laughs> that I don't care if I die, if the dog dies, you know, if the world explodes, it still has to have a happy ending at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and it does. It absolutely knows. does. It definitely ends on a, a positive note. So I, I think they did a really great job with that. I think so, too. My thanks to Marty one more time for coming on the podcast and uh, discussing her journey with Adele with us. Uh, the movie is available right now. There is a link on our site, theoryofpets.com. While you're on there, there's also a spot for any questions that you might have, uh, either for me or if you have any questions for Marty, I can pass those on to her as well and get some answers for you. Uh, check out the movie. It's just one of those really inspiring documentaries that I promise you will walk away feeling really inspired by um and of course if you guys don't mind jumping on itunes it only takes a second to give me a review on there for theory of pets and the podcast when i reach out to people like marty or experts in the pet industry that uh, come on to talk about everything from training and grooming to different products available i it's really a lot easier for me if I can show them that there's people out there listening and enjoying the show. So uh, if you guys could do that, it only takes a second on iTunes and I would really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for listening, guys. I will be back soon with another episode.